This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Many of us still rely on fossil fuels for heating our homes, either by burning something like natural gas for heat or by using it to produce electricity to power space heaters and air conditioners. And typically resistive electric heat is about 100% efficient. For every watt you put in, you get one joule of heat back out. However, we have a solution that could move three to five times more heat than the electricity that we put into it. Heat pumps are an amazing piece of counterintuitive technology that can be three to 500% efficient. In the past, they struggled in more extreme conditions, but things have come a long way since then. How well do heat pumps actually work and should we be using them everywhere? Let's see if we can come to a decision on this. I'm Matt Farrell, welcome to Undecided. I'm in the process of starting to build a new net zero home and have been spending way too much time looking into getting the most efficient setup that I can. The rabbit hole that I went down sent me on a strange path through the world of heat pumps, where I discovered some things I didn't know were an option. Heating and cooling systems are one of the largest sources of energy use in most homes around the globe. In Europe, they represent 50% of the total energy consumption, with approximately 80% still based on fossil fuels. Here in the US, heating and cooling electricity use is lower at around 31%, but that's still substantial and many homes are still heated directly using natural gas and oil. Just the US alone is producing about 441 million tons of carbon dioxide annually just from our heating and cooling needs. But what if there was a technology that didn't require fossil fuels and seemingly breaks the laws of physics by producing more heating energy than the electricity that you put into it? Enter the crazy world of heat pumps. In the world of physics, you have something called the conservation of energy. In a nutshell, the energy within a closed system must remain constant. You can't create or destroy energy. You can only move it. At a surface level, heat pumps seem to defy this rule because you get three to five times more heat energy out of a heat pump for every watt of electricity that you put into it. But it's not creating heat energy. It's only moving it. You're essentially using one watt of electricity to move three to five joules of heat. For instance, heat pumps extract heat from the outside air or ground to heat the inside of a home or office building. They can also operate in reverse to chill your house, just like an air conditioner. They move heat from the inside of your home back out into the ground or outside air. In essence, a heat pump is simply a series of heat exchangers, moving hot air out of the house during a cooling cycle and hot air into the house during a warming cycle. Now we'll start by taking a look at how heat pumps heat and cool our homes, but there are some other interesting ways that we can put heat pumps to work in our everyday lives. We'll go through two of those as well. So let's start with the first area, which I've already touched on, and it's heating and cooling your home. The most common type of heat pump used for this purpose is air-to-air -air heat pumps. Now, these pumps are pretty similar to air conditioning systems, but in order to provide heating and cooling, a reversing valve is used. In heating mode, the outdoor unit blows air over a refrigerant that's flowing through tubes, which boils at a very low temperature. The common fluid used is R134A, and it has a boiling point of negative 26.3 degrees Celsius, or about negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit. As the refrigerant heats up, it begins to turn into a vapor. A compressor is used to increase the pressure and temperature of the refrigerant and vapor. As the vapor moves into the evaporator, it releases the heat into the room, which turns the vapor back into a liquid, and that cycle continues. In cooling mode, it's basically reversing that flow of the system. Heat is extracted from the inside of the home, turning the refrigerant into a vapor, which is compressed and sent outside, where the fan blows over the coils, moving the heat into the outside air. Air source heat pumps achieve great efficiency levels with a coefficient of performance, or COP, of about 3 to 4. It means that for every 1 watt of electricity, 3 to 4 joules of heat is achieved. Now, comparatively, a high-efficiency boiler powered with oil or gas achieves about 85%, or a COP below 1. That's actually what I have in my home today, a natural gas furnace that's around 85% efficient. I'm going to be changing that soon, but more on that later. Heat pumps are very flexible and can work with forced air, as well as underfloor or radiant systems, but you may need a larger size radiator to ensure that its surface area is large enough for releasing enough heat into the room. And unlike natural gas and oil furnaces, Heat pumps are environmentally friendly since they don't release any harmful gases. However, the major challenges for making heat pumps the mainstream choice are the upfront cost, reduced efficiency in very cold climates, depending on the technology, and a lack of regulations in some parts of the globe. According to the Energy Savings Trust, an air source heat pump for a four bedroom detached home located in Northern Ireland can annually provide about 4,300 pounds or about $5,600 in savings and avoid 6.5 tons of CO2 emissions when compared to an old G-rated liquid gas boiler. Comparatively, in the US, an average homeowner can save between $815 and $929 per year by replacing an electric furnace and oil boiler with a heat pump. However, if you consider a natural gas boiler, the savings are lower since gas is so cheap, which means a savings of about $200 per year. While heat pumps are usually a more efficient alternative to traditional heating systems, 
they won't be able to accomplish those COPs everywhere. When the ambient temperature drops below 10 degrees Celsius or about 14 degrees Fahrenheit or lower, the heat pump's electric power consumption rate increases to ensure the heat pump's optimal operation. On top of that, at very low temperatures, frost can accumulate over the outdoor coil, which can reduce its efficiency. HVAC installers suggest installing a small resistant electric heater to the system in order to complement the operation of heat pumps in some locations for the coldest days of the year. In those cases, heat pump systems still come out ahead for efficiency over the course of a year. The end result is that savings depends on the location and the climate of the installation. Some states, particularly in the southeastern part of the country, benefit more than states like Wisconsin. Another type of heat pump is the ground air heat pump, which I explored in my geothermal heating and cooling video. I'm actually looking into installing one of these in my new home, by the way. I'm building a new net zero super efficient house, so be sure to subscribe if you wanna see videos on that. And one of the assessments performed while planning our HVAC system estimated that our yearly operating costs for heat, air conditioning, and hot water would be about $2,121 a year for an air to air heat pump system. A geothermal system by comparison would cost us about $1,175 a year to operate. Now in basic principle, geothermal systems work the same way as air to air, but liquid is circulated through tubes deep into the ground. They're also highly efficient with a COP of three to five, but their problem is the high upfront cost, which ranges from $10,000 to $30,000 according to Energy Sage, but it can go even higher. It's mainly due to the cost of digging and drilling to install the ground loops, and those costs increase with deeper holes and tighter spaces. Although they are costly when compared to traditional fossil fuel systems, they can save between 25 and 50% of heating and cooling costs. According to the Department of Energy, they have a payback period of five to 10 years and can work efficiently basically everywhere since the ground has lower temperature variations compared to the air. Heat pumps aren't just about space heating and cooling your home. But before we get into the other options, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, CuriosityStream. If you'd like to watch more videos on topics just like this, you should really check it out. They have thousands of documentaries and nonfiction shows on pretty much every topic that you can think of. If you enjoy science and technology, which I'm assuming you do since you're watching this channel, they have documentaries like Engineering the Future, which explores everything from the future of flight to tidal energy to solar, as well as one of the world's largest wind farms being built off the English coast. CuriosityStream really does have something for everybody, including 35 collections handpicked by experts, including some award-winning exclusives and originals. Best of all is that you can stream it to any device, anytime, anywhere. It really is smart TV for your smart TV. And they have a special offer for all of you if you sign up with the code UNDECIDED. You'll get an entire year for just $14.99. That's an incredible deal. The link is in the description below, and thanks to CuriosityStream and to all of you for supporting the channel. So back to two other areas where heat pumps are making a difference. They can also be used to generate hot water, especially if you combine it with your heating and cooling system. They can be integrated into hot water heaters, immersion heaters, and circulation pumps. Standalone heat pump water heaters are an efficient alternative that can provide considerable electricity savings. While tankless water heaters are popular, they have long return on investments from 15 to 18 years, where hybrid water heaters have a return on investment of four to seven years, with a lifespan of about 15 years. In addition, they include a backup electric resistance heater in case the ambient air isn't warm enough to heat the water to the desired temperature. However, you do have to take into consideration where they're being installed. They have to be installed in an area of your property where the temperature ranges from 40 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 4.4 to 32 degrees Celsius, and they require at least 1,000 cubic feet, or 28.3 cubic meters, of airspace around the water heater to operate to spec. This works out great for a garage or a basement installation, but not so much for a small utility closet. Another potential problem, or benefit, depending on where they're installed, is that these hybrid heaters extract heat from the ambient air where they're installed, which makes the room colder. That might be something you actually want though. They can provide energy savings from $200 to $600 per year, and the cost of a 50 gallon tank is about $1,200 and about $2,500 for an 80 gallon tank. But the prices vary based on size and product quality. In addition, you can expect to spend about six dollars to $800 with labor costs to install a standalone water heater. However, there may be incentives and rebates where you live, like the federal government's $300 tax credit. According to the Department of Energy, the average heat pump style hot water heater costs roughly $225 per year to operate, compared to four to $800 for many traditional tank hot water heaters. Now, according to Energy Star, the average cost of running a hybrid electric heat pump water heater for a household of four is $300 per year, compared to $600 for a standard electric water heater. Now, the US-based company Rheem produces several models of standalone water heaters, which can provide $491 per year in energy savings, qualifies for local utility rebates, and are four times more efficient than conventional water heaters. Some even come with built-in Wi-Fi to connect a smartphone app for more control and tracking use. 
One of my patrons, Paul, who runs the website Tinker Try, has documented his experience living with one of these water heaters. Three years ago, our home's natural gas water heater failed. Gladly, I was able to quickly find a Ream hybrid electric water heater and an installer who got the price down to about the same as a new gas heater would have been using our statewide $750 incentive coupon. This new heat pump based water heater allowed us to ditch our basement's dehumidifier while reusing the same drain line. The occasional fridge like noises aren't a problem as it's in our unfinished back area of our basement around 20 feet away. Using Ream's Econet app, I was able to figure that we've been running at about $195 a year for electrically heated hot water, handling 2.5 showers a day on average and all our other hot water use. If you want to see more details about his experience, I'll include a link in the description to his website. And finally, the third area where heat pumps are gaining some traction, and one that I wasn't aware of until just recently, is laundry. Heat pump style clothes dryers or ventless dryers, if we want to be more specific, are becoming more popular. Instead of venting warm, humid air to the outside of the house, which is a huge efficiency hit to your home, by the way, a heat pump dryer runs it through an evaporator to remove the moisture without losing too much heat. There's some great pros to changing to a ventless dryer like nearly silent operation, no need for exterior venting, and much higher efficiency. Now, these heat pump dryers use refrigerant and condenser coils, making them 28 to 50% more energy efficient than standard dryers. And they can be installed in a closet, placed under a counter, or stacked in a corner since they don't need venting. Now, obviously, there are some cons. The big one is that the heat pump dryers cost twice as much as a traditional dryer. Another is that they don't get quite as hot as a traditional dryer. It can take a little longer to fully dry your clothes, but even with the added drying time, the overall energy use is still lower. And that con kind of comes down to your level of patience. Companies like GE and Mila have already started to sell ventless dryers here in the US. They're far more common in Europe. Mila, for example, manufactures several models of heat pump dryers that range in price from 899 pounds to 2,799 pounds. GE offers four models with interesting features like sensor dry technology that monitors moisture and temperature continuously to avoid wear and tear on your clothes caused by over drying and the inconsistent heat. The prices of GE ventless dryers range from $999 to about $1,419. At the end of the day, the cost per load of laundry for a traditional electric dryer can be between 53 cents and 55 cents. A gas dryer comes in around 38 to 39 cents and a heat pump dryer spins in around 17 to 33 cents. While heat pump dryers may cost more upfront, they'll definitely save you money over time. And on that note, they'll last much longer. In some cases, the lifespan is almost double of a traditional electric or gas dryer, something to factor into your decision making. So with these three key areas for homeowners to adopt heat pumps, how does the future adoption look? The global heat pump market is predicted to grow at a rate of about 8.1% from 2022 to 2030, with a market value of about $67.7 billion in 2021. But with new government incentives like tax credits and rebates, this market may grow even faster. Washington, for example, has updated its energy code and become the first state in the US to require energy efficient electric heat pumps over traditional furnaces and water heaters. The rules apply to four story commercial and multifamily residential buildings and starts in July of 2022. In most cases, the new rules effectively ban some standard HVAC systems like natural gas, as well as less efficient heating systems that use electric resistance. According to a Rocky Mountain Institute analysis, the new required shift towards electric heat pumps could save an estimated 8.1 million tons of carbon emissions by 2050. That's the equivalent of taking about 1.6 million cars off the road for a year. As I mentioned, I'm building a new net zero home and I'm definitely getting a heat pump installed for heating and cooling, most likely a ground source system, as well as for hot water and our dryer. And if it's powered with renewable energy, which it will be, I'm getting solar, those heat pumps will be carbon free and saving me money. Heat pumps have an important role to play in our net zero future. So I guess you could say that I'm all in on heat pumps and think we should heat pump all the things. So stay tuned if you wanna see how that goes later in the year. So what do you think? Do you think we need to heat pump all the things too? Jump in the comments and let me know. If you like this video, be sure to check out one of the ones I have over here. And thanks to all my patrons for your continued support. And thanks to all of you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.